Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode 13. This is your open source for digital currency news. Uh, every week we talk about the um, biggest, latest news, most impactful news in the cryptocurrency community and the Bitcoin community. So um, some, some big news happened this week. Uh, one of the major things that we've been kind of like waiting for to find out what happens is Charlie Shrem, the uh, former CEO of BitInstant and the former vice chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation. Charlie Shrem has reached a plea deal uh, with the U.S. government to um, reduce his original charges. Um, he was originally originally charged with money laundering um, and and you know conspiracy to you know, commit money laundering and and operating an unlicensed money transmitter. So he's gotten his charges reduced to just unli unlicensed uh, money transmission. And it looks like he may be able to uh, go free. He won't necessarily get jail time um, based on that one charge, but it's it's up to the judge to decide. Um, so like, I didn't know that much about um, Charlie Shrem's case before this week. And I kind of went back and like read up on basically what they charged him with and why and um but basically he was he was tangentially he was allegedly tangentially in, involved with the silk road online illicit marketplace um where he he was accused of facilitating over a million dollars worth of 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 bitcoin and selling it to people who wanted to use it to buy drugs off of Silk Road. So um, that's what he was accused of, and he was arrested in January. And um, he was under house arrest basically up, up until this point, although he was able to have um, uh, basically 12 hours a day starting in May. He was allowed to leave his house for 12 hours a day and, you know, do whatever. So it was like partial house arrest, I guess. Um, but at this point, um, they've made a lot of progress and they've reached an agreement. He will plead guilty to uh, operating an unli unlicensed money transmitter. Um, no conspiracy charges, no money laundering charges. But the same can't necessarily be said for his, uh, his co-defendant, Robert Fiella, um, who was more allegedly more deeply involved in Silk Road who he supposedly ran his own storefront on Silk Road uh, for selling bitcoins to people who who wanted to transact with, with drugs and illicit goods on Silk Road. So he actually ran like like an actual like Silk Road like storefront, um, and Shrem did not. So that you know, it's we don't know yet if Fiella is is um, also going to reach a plea deal, or if he's going to stand trial on September twenty second. Um, for what the government accuses him, him of doing, but um, this is good news. This is progress for for Charlie Shrem. This is this is progress for the um, community as a whole in relation to like criminal laws. Because um, with the earlier charges that Charlie Shrem was faced with, he was facing up to 30 years in prison, max, for um, the previous three charges, and now it's dropped to five years max, and most analysts are hoping or actually predicting that he might not get any jail time at all based on that one charge. So progress, right? Yeah, it's good news for him. Um, could potentially be good news for uh, the Bitcoin community too, because this guy obviously did a lot before he got arrested. You know, he, um, he ran bit instant and was with the uh, Bitcoin foundation, which, does a lot you know wh whether or not you think what they do is is uh beneficial i mean they still do a lot in the big whether or not the results and, are beneficial or not yeah. but they had good aims yeah so um i mean what do you think he's gonna do now you think he's gonna go back to the foundation or... um you know i i doubt that i don't i don't think that he would go back to the foundation just because of all the all the controversy basically like that's the original reason he resigned from the Bitcoin Foundation is because um, that he didn't. It wasn't an admission of guilt, but he didn't want the controversy surrounding his case 
to like muddy up the the goals and the and the work of the foundation because if if like if such a high profile person in the foundation is dealing with all these legal troubles and you know all these accusations and stuff it can potentially reflect badly on the foundation itself because then they have to deal with like you know publicity issues and you know um public perception of of them so like he 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 did the right thing by just cutting himself off from it and you know i i don't i don't see any reason for him to to want to go back to the bitcoin foundation but i do think that like he's he will stay involved with bitcoin um i i think that he'll he'll get back to back involved with the community and um and and keep keep working on you know bitcoin related ventures maybe start up a new company like he, you know he started up bit instant which was one of the first like like bitcoin exchanges back in the early days of bitcoin and that was like that was revolutionary back then that was a that was a vital service for the community but now we have plenty of exchanges to service that need in the community so it'll be interesting interesting to see if he chooses something totally different that um that might provide more benefit for the community in like t in today's ecosystem yeah I, I would hope he would start a new com uh, company or something rather than going back to the foundation but Going back to the the reasons you stated for why he wouldn't go back or why they wouldn't want him back, my response to that would be, well, they replaced him with Brock Pierce, so mm -hmm. obviously they don't care too much about uh, publicity and uh, reputations. But, but yeah, it well, seems Brock like Pierce wasn't, I don't really wasn't know accused founder... of dealing with you know of 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 providing million dollars to a drug marketplace. Yeah, you know, he was accused of a lot worse things like, uh, like sexually abusing it. children. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not formally though. He wasn't. He um, wasn't charged with a crime or anything, right? I don't think so. I think it was just. Uh, I think I think some of the people he worked with at that company might have been, and he was like associated with them. But you know, Brock Pierce himself wasn't, you know, arrested and charged with anything yeah, like that. But of um, controversy. But yeah, yeah, your 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 point is basically you're right like yeah. the bitcoin foundation doesn't care that much about uh, they, don't, they don't care that much about like having having people on their on their board who are you know are really influential people in the community like brock pierce isn't really in influential at all in, in the community like at, at least at least in terms of like uh, services or or like uh, programs that he's provided um, or apps or anything like that. And then, I mean, of course, going back to like earlier examples as well, Mark Carpolis was on the foundation as well. And, and, yeah. and, and he basically facilitated and oversaw the, the greatest failure of any Bitcoin <laughs> entity in the history of Bitcoin so far. So yeah, and, the, um... the, yeah, the, the, the morals of the people on the foundation board or whatever is, it is fairly irrelevant. Yeah, and uh, Brock Pierce and Carpal is, um, you know, before Mark Carpal got involved in Mount Gox, he didn't really have any experience with Bitcoin, like right? Yeah, I'm, he didn't. And, he didn't even create Mount Gox. It was uh, yeah. Jed McCallum who created Mount Gox, and then Carpal bought it from him and started running yeah. it. Yeah, and then um, Brock Pierce, before before he got involved with the foundation, he did pretty much nothing with bitcoin like he wasn't a prominent member uh, in the bitcoin community he was he's a well-known like digital entrepreneur he did some things with everquest and he like made some money off of you know doing something for the world at warcraft gold or something i don't know it was one of the scams he ran um and he, and he was in I the guess, mighty ducks movie don't forget yeah, and, that and he's and he's in mighty ducks <laughs> But I mean, he might have been. He was probably interested in Bitcoin for a while, but he never. Yeah. He never did anything like Charlie Shrimp. Like he didn't start any like groundbreaking businesses or anything in the Bitcoin economy. Um, mm. But anyways, yeah. I was. I wasn't wanting to bash the foundation this episode because we've been doing that for like a month straight. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, I can't yeah. really see Charlie Shrimp going back to the uh, foundation because. I mean, after he resigned, you know, they replaced them. You know, they hired two new people to replace Carpolis and Shrem, which was, uh, who was it? Brock Pierce and John Matonis? What? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure about the exact, like, positions and, and how they shuffled that around. 
Yeah, so like really, um, I can't see them actually having anything for Shrem to do. So right. hopefully he'll get back into the uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurial world of Bitcoin and start some new cool company. Yeah, it should be interesting. Um, you know, I just I wanna I wanna read like the exact um, you know supposed law or or charge that he that he's pleading guilty to which is being an unlicensed money transmitter and and possibly extrapolate what that means for the rest of, of the Bitcoin community based on this case. Um, basically, an unlicensed money transmitter um, is is someone who uh, who knowingly conducts, controls, manages, supervises, directs, or owns all or part of an unlicensed money transmitting business shall be fined in accordance with this title or not in, or in prisons not more than five years or both and basically m unlicensed money transit transmission otherwise involves the transportation or transmission of funds that are known to the defendant to have been derived from a criminal offense or are intended to be used to promote or support unlawful activity so um bit instant itself was fully compliant that was that was you know it was registered with the, with the treasury as a money services business um on on the face of it it was fully compliant with all the regulations it was supposed to follow but um shrem being charged with operating an unlicensed money transmitter business that's not talking about bit instant itself because bit instant bit instant was licensed it was following the regulations it seems like to me that they're just they're basically saying and Shrem is agreeing that the, to them when they say this by by the plea deal, is that him transferring like a million dollars worth of, of money to to um, his co-defendant Robert Fiella to sell on Silk Road, um, that itself is an unlicensed money transmission business. So um, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird how the the legal system is trying to um, basically say that. You know, you don't have to have an actual company that doing this stuff. If you are transacting like a million dollars or more in in Bitcoin transactions that are tangentially related to to an illegal enterprise, then they can try and hit you with this money license, you know, transmitter thing anyway. Um, which you know, pretty pretty interesting that that they, they that they can do that and that defendants might actually plead guilty to that. Um, so I guess if for anyone, you know, thinking that, oh, like I've made this great Bitcoin business, I'm good, I'm fully licensed, I'm fully regulated. Um, if you think you can do stuff on the side um, that is kind of in a gr legal gray area, they'll still come after you, even if you mm -hmm. have like an, a fully licensed business on the front of it. If you're doing stuff on the side, million dollars worth, um, there's people who, you know, work for the government and are probably analyzing the blockchain these huge transactions and stuff like that to try and nab people like Shrem. And um, it's tragic that they got him in the first place because in my opinion, I don't think that this money license transmitter bullshit um, should really be a crime. Um, it, it, it's, it's not like, it's not like he was funding, you know, um, you know, drug cartels himself. It's not like he was funding murderous drug cartels in, in Mexico who chop people's heads off and, and do crazy stuff like that. He, he was just, you know, if the allegations are true, he was just um, helping uh, uh, an existing market, um, you know, need. Uh, it just happened to be an unregulated, um, t totally free marketplace that was created on, on the dark net. And he wanted to support that and he also made some money off it at the same time which really pissed off the government if you are helping out illegal activities and you're also making a lot of money off it that's when they'll that's really when they'll come after you so uh yeah yeah, yeah uh shrimps uh, the original charge that he pled not guilty to was conspiracy to commit money laundering uh, so it, it sounds like Fiello was, you know, the real the real criminal, the guy who's like actually laundering the coins, and you know, Shrim was using BitInstant to give him access to cheap coins. So 
Shroom was basically guilty of being associated with a money launderer, and you know the government is accusing or accused him of um, of knowingly contributing to a money laundering operation. Um, and then when he decided to plead guilty to lesser charges, which ended up being unlicensed money transmission, running an unlicensed money transmission business. Um, so yeah, definitely you got to be careful what you're doing, and just because. Just because uh, Bitcoin is kind of like a gray market phenomenon doesn't mean it exempts you from doing things in the black market. You could still get in a lot of trouble, regardless of whether or not you th you think that the things you're doing should be illegal or not. Yeah. Uh, the government definitely thinks that they should be illegal, and they're going to punish you for it. So. Yeah, I mean they they have the resources. They don't have the resources to go after like everyone and try and track like all the people who use Bitcoin. That that'd be ridiculous. It'd be too hard, unless they have a quantum com computer who, that can like analyze all this stuff with an algorithm or something. But but they they were aware of Silk Road for a very long time. I think it it came to the attention of the U.S. Senate like as early as as early as 2010 maybe or maybe 2011. And you know the government was watching it for basically two years after that and it's they're not stupid they know how to get on the dark net they just can't track people that easily but like if if they notice that a certain seller is making a, a ton of money um doing this stuff like they're they're gonna go after the big the big fish first and you know they they went after ross ulbricht they went after charlie shrem the people who are basically dealing in you know at least a million dollars worth of bitcoin um, for for this enterprise and like <laughs> they if if the allegations are true they had some balls they had some balls doing this stuff and and apparently like um, based on the allegations and the and the charges that were filed against Charlie Shrem the government seems to have known uh, that like or at least claimed that Shrem, you know, knew what Fiello was doing on the Silk Road. He he actively like promoted um, Fiello's um, activities on Silk Road and laundering the bitcoins. But how would the government know that stuff unless they somehow got access to their email correspondence, right? Like how how do you discern someone's motivation uh, based on their even if you can analyze the blockchain and all that? Um, they, they must have found a way to track their email correspondence or message correspondence or something and uh, basically try and try and discern the motivations of, of Shrem and, uh, and and use that in the case against him. So that's that's like another that's another aspect to this that kind of brings up privacy implications like, like they they have they have the resources to to pull up email databases with the help of the NSA and um, and and try and you know spread that spread that uh, information across these various federal agencies to to try and catch people like this who are making millions of dollars on the you know online crypto black market. So they've got the resources to go after the big fish for sure. Yeah, and a few weeks ago. Um you know, Ross Ulbricht's defense team basically accused the FBI of of searching uh, Silk Road servers and Ulbricht's computers without a warrant. So you know, it's definitely not out of the question that they wouldn't, you know, actually get into the records of people working uh, like within the exchange if they did it to mm. the person running uh, the marketplace. So it's. Maybe it's not as much of a tinfoil hat conspiracy as it sounds. Yeah. Because I mean, they're doing it. Yeah, they are. The question is, <clears throat> question is just how, like, how much will they be able to do it in the future, as this sort of thing keeps happening, as you know things like Open Bazaar come out, where you don't have a, a single operator of, of of a website and it's totally free for all the participants in the marketplace. And they can do whatever they want. Like, th you won't you won't have a single like big fish that you can catch and like d and take take them down. Um, uh, it'll it'll really it'll be on the it'll be on the onus of the user for to have to make their own personal responsibility and you know cover up their tracks and use encryption, be private, uh, 
and you know that's that's a that's a development that's a that's a progress in the community um people are inventing new ways to kind of uh hide themselves uh cover their tracks and make sure that make sure that they uh that the government can't find them as easily the government doesn't have unlimited resources and they aren't all powerful uh if you can if you can find ways if you're careful about it then you can not get caught i mean just look at what happened after uh silk road was busted like 10 or 15 other marketplaces opened up doing the exact same things and you know nobody's caught them yet so obviously uh people are learning how to make themselves more invisible and it's only it's only going to get worse as the government gets stricter on it. So, you know, you're, you'll have people... Right now, you have uh, Open Bazaar, which is something that's going to be impossible to take down. And then the individuals, you know, operating businesses on Open Bazaar are going to become uh, increasingly invisible to the point where it's just not going to be worth the government's time and money to find them. Mm-hmm. And it's just a direct response to uh, them, you know, trying to enforce this drug war... It's kind of ridiculous hmm. as yeah. a whole. They're going to realize eventually that uh, it's it's kind of futile and that they should probably just leave people alone and uh, let them let them live their own lives freely. It'll take a while, but I, you know we're slowly reaching that point where the government's efforts are kind of kind of futile when you really look at the details and when you think about how people can use personal responsibility to protect themselves then it becomes uh, more apparent that people can work towards uh, better freedom and that you don't have to be afraid of the government. Um, yeah, they, they, have, they, they don't have as much power as a lot of people think they do. Like on both sides of the political spectrum, um, like liberals have this idea that the government is so powerful that you know it can create these amazing social programs that make everyone's lives better and you know create this brand new paradise where everything's awesome and perfect and then like libertarians fear that government is like so powerful that it'll, that it'll like overtake everything if they even give up an inch but i don't i don't think either is true i think that the government is actually just just a collection of of people who don't have very good jobs they're they don't have actually very productive jobs that actually serve a market need and they just go about their jobs thinking that they're making a world better place by forcing other people to do things and like they're not wizards they can't they can't like wave a magic wand and and force everyone in the in the whole country to uh to behave a certain way they use they use fear basically they use fear to convince people to change their own behavior Plus, their entire existence and operation relies on people accepting their legitimacy, right? And so, yeah, um, yeah I've I've kind of noticed ever since I've I've got into politics and started following it, and you know, reading up on like the history of the United States government, like, the more the more they try to do things, the more they try to get involved in the people's private lives, um, the more people hate them. So they're not infinitely powerful, even in the simple sense that um, that the more involved they get in people's private lives, uh, the less legitimate they will be. They will appear to people who are being whose rights are being violated. So um, it's not it's not like this just this endless um, this endless uh, immortal agency that's going to go on forever and ever. It's only going to go on as long as enough people believe in it. Yeah. Um, and the worst job they do, uh, which seems to, you know, they they seem to be doing, you know, worse, the worse and worse, and worse job as time goes on. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, people are just gonna like, I honestly don't think a lot, like a lot of people have these like dreams and visions of like this, you know, beautiful violent revolution where like everything is overthrown and it's like this new era of peace and prosperity. But yeah. you know, realistically, if, if there is any t- type of revolution at all or, the, or a paradigm shift, it's just going to be people are going to get bored of the government. Like they're going to be like, yeah, they're not really doing a good job. I can um, instead of taking the city bus, you know, I can use Lyft or Uber. 
it's hmm. gonna it's gonna be small things like that. Uh, people are just kind of gonna kind of forget that the government's there, and then eventually, um, you know, some totally new system of conducting society will come in place, probably yeah. through technological advances. Yeah, it'll get to a point where eventually people realize the government is just obsolete. All the stuff that you hoped to accomplish through government can now be accomplished through other means, more efficiently and more cheaply. Including maybe even national defense uh, that that'll be rendered obsolete in terms of government. You know, if 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 like if individual communities can potentially like uh, crowdfund like an army of drones or something like that that are maybe outfitted with like long distance tasers or something crazy like that. And if it's if it's just controlled by by a single community who all trust each other, then that's like an that's an infinitely um, better version of like a police department, possibly, if the drones can can be accurate and and just in terms of like how they enforce that community's laws and stuff. That'd be much better than um, than a brutal police department that has like tons of high powered weapons and tanks and stuff like that. And it'll also be better than um, than the NSA surveillance apparatus, which collects information on everyone indiscriminately so like <laughs> um government government programs that are supposed to protect us end up being a threat more than protection and that's because of the inherent flaw of government um technology is finally allowing us uh possible solutions where people can take back control of their own security and of their own responsibility um and create better technological inventions that that achieve that goal better. So, yeah, I, th I think the future looks good in terms of in terms of like public um, in terms of public goods, which were an originally promised by the idea of government. It's just obsolete. It's gonna people are gonna realize that soon. Yeah, it's you know it's actually kind of uh, a really interesting observation of the uh, just kind of like the ideological shift. Uh, in the libertarian community, like uh, what's you know, like the Bitcoin community and uh, crypto anarchists and and um, you know people like that, because uh, usually when people think of uh, libertarianism or um, anarcho-capitalism more specifically, they think of people like uh, like Murray Rothbard is you know pretty much the, he is the creator of the philosophy uh, essentially, and it's it's. His philosophy is, is uh, completely wrapped up in this ideological, political rhetoric of hatred for the state, like, um, like a, a moral arguments and things like that. So people have this idea of anarcho-capitalists who are like, um, they're just, they just want to like get their get their guns, and like overthrow everything. But then yeah. you have this new, you have this new kind of like blossoming community of uh, developers and people. Um, and people who are just interested in new technology and things, uh, and then so anarchy is kind of like becoming not so much this scary radical political thing. It's just um, it's just kind of like th this way to provide the same things, do the same things that governments do, just better and, yes. and cheaper. Like um, like you when when you listen to like or when you. A lot, a lot of the discussions that go on in the Bitcoin community and the crypto anarchy community, it's not. A lot of it is ideological and and uh, and political, but also a lot of it is just you know how are we going to make Bitcoin better? How are we going to make all these projects better? Just to you know make everybody's lives better. Like they don't, they don't really. It's not really a discussion about how are we going to overthrow the government. It's just you know how are we going to live better and be more prosperous in the future? Yeah. It it kind of it kind of takes the a little bit of the scary aspect um, out of out of anarchy that a lot of people drives a lot of people away from it. Yeah, um, like I, I don't I don't know that much about the whole anarchy philosophy myself. Like I know like just even just a few years ago, like my personal vision of anarchy was like, yeah, yeah, these people just want to overthrow the government and and have like no state at all whatsoever. But then they don't they don't have a plan for like what happens after that, you know, like basically anarchy is synonymous with chaos for a lot of people. 
and they just want to take down the government and then just have like a free for all basically after that and you know survival of the fittest and natural selection and you know survive if you can if you have the guns to survive and the food and the water then then great you're all good and the gold you know for when there's no state money but like like you, you no matter where you are, you still live like in a community. Even if you're totally is- isolated from like the physical world, you can still have an online community. Like you're still in a community that needs protection, that like wants to do stuff for the public good, that wants you know p- people want to care for each other in the community, make sure that there's not a lot of homeless people, um, people starving in the streets and stuff like that. So like. Um, like I I don't know does does anarchy does do anarchist philosophers like like pr- put forward any plans like that for you know for creating things for the public good once there's no government to do it because that was the original point of government like in my mind is to create um, stuff for the common good um, but like up until recently it seemed like there was no um, no plan in place for improving communities without government. Because, like, it, no one wants to go towards a society where everyone's at each other's throats, you know, for, for, for food or, or money and there's, like, no order and, like, you know, just the, like, a wild, wild west society, you know, that's, that's breaking down and, and degrading itself. But that's what a lot of people fear with no government. And, and you know, people who, who don't trust the government and don't think that it's doing a very good job on any side of the political spectrum if you don't want government then like we need to propose solutions that will um achieve those original goals uh without government and we can do that now with with technology it seems like yeah the the general idea um most most of the solutions to things like how are we going to take care of public goods and like social welfare and things like that they're more economics arguments um but uh the general philosophy that anarcho-capitalists have is one of uh, polycentric law, where there's not there's not an absence of government. There's just no state. Like there's no like one massive overreaching uh, entity that has a you know monopoly on law across a vast geographical area. It's just a um, a collection of like small communities and cities and neighborhoods and things like that, and they all voluntarily contract with each other. Um, to basic rules on how they're going to conduct their society, and the main feature that uh, that most um, anarcho-libertarians uh, advocate for is in these social con- contracts, there has to be um, a termination clause. You have to be able to secede um, from the social contract. Like that's that's the main problem. Uh, a lot of anarchists have with the state system of government is that you can't secede. Like you'll be you'll be forcefully prevented from seceding. It's like there's there's nobody that wants to be like complete absence of order and it's state of nature and everybody has to kill each other for food. It's just um a different system of social contracts and it's you know it's a whole it's a whole theory. There's been like you know entire books written about it so we can't go into it here because we have time constraints. But um it's it's a lot um it goes a lot deeper and it's much more thought out than people uh think it is so you know if you're interested in it uh you know anybody who's watching should definitely look it up polycentric wall okay nice <laughs> that, that that discussion kind of went down a down a, <laughs> down a random long road <laughs> okay so uh, back to bitcoin yeah back to bitcoin and cryptocurrency news um so one thing that came out this week is that uh, various companies and, and crypto organizations are going to work together to distribute uh, free Bitcoin to 70,000 people on an island nation in the Caribbean Sea. This nation is called Dominica, not to be confused with the Dominican Republic. It's its own country. Um, so Dominican Dominica citizens... 70,000 of them, over 70,000, will get free Bitcoin. Each one will get, is planned to get at least $10 worth of free Bitcoin. And uh, uh, Coinapult, which is Eric Voorhees' company, um, Coinapult is going to help distribute this via SMS, which is text message on, on cell phones. So I guess vast majority of people on this island have cell phones. They'll be able to get this text message with free Bitcoin. 
And uh, this event is called the Bit Drop. <laughs> clever, kind of a clever name. <laughs> and uh, they're basically gonna they're gonna throw like a party um, on the island where people can go and spend their their new Bitcoin. And there's gonna be like educational seminars for people who want to learn about Bitcoin. And they're also gonna try and get a bunch of merchants on board on the island to accept Bitcoin. So the idea is like all these people who have never been introduced to Bitcoin before get Bitcoin and now they ha have a, an avenue to spend it on a bunch of different places on this one island and they're trying to create like a, a brand new Bitcoin haven on this small island country. So uh, um, fascinating, ex fascinating experiment. Um, I don't know if it's going to uh, promote adoption that much unless they are really, really good at educating all these people um, and, and getting like somehow getting like 99% of merchants on board with this. But it's a very interesting ex experiment and it's, and it's going to go down. Um, it's going to go down on um, March 14th, uh, 2015. And, uh, and they're raising money now. They're starting to raise money. It was just announced this week and they're going to start raising money for this. Um, um, banksworstfear.com, which is uh, one of the websites that is helping to promote, to promote this, they're going to match up to a thousand dollars in donations to this experiment. And um, I personally am not planning to donate any of this to this because I would rather donate uh, free Bitcoin to an actual charitable event instead of donating to people on an island to have a party. But um, it'll be interesting to, fi to find out if it's if it's gonna um, get like a, a like a majority of the people on this island to be using Bitcoin and like maybe possibly creating their own mini like economy on this island. So uh, what do you what do you think? So the main focus of the story seems to be the party and the free Bitcoin. Like I'm looking at the CoinDesk article right now, and the headline is seventy thousand Caribbean island residents to receive Bitcoin in 2015. And then, you know, like, the second sentence is about the party. Um, yes. It's just, it's a clear, it's, it's an obvious marketing ploy for all the companies involved in organizing it. Because, uh, I mean, let's be honest, they're getting, these people are getting $10 in Bitcoin uh, they're going to go to the party and uh, basically they're just going to use it as like a free drink ticket. They're going to buy a couple drinks. Um, their their $10 is going to be gone, you know, back and it's going to go back to the organization. To the organiz organizers, yeah. Yeah, like you like you, you brought that up uh, before we started recording. It's just going to go back to the organization that is putting this whole thing on. I think where the real story lies is what they're doing kind of behind the scenes. Um because you know they're they're having all these uh, educational seminars at the party, but then also, also if um, once this whole like party thing is over, they're planning on uh, trying to further educate people, and uh, they're also bringing in uh, infrastructure, Bitcoin infrastructure for free. Like they're going to be providing merchants with uh, with uh, point, of, point sale. of sale systems, and they're going to be installing uh, ATMs. So, I, and I think that is the most important part of this project because um, since they're doing it through through SMS, since they're giving these people the free Bitcoin through SMS, obviously it's not a very technologically advanced place, and so a lot of them are probably unbanked as well. So, mm -hmm. the party, I think, is completely like a 100% total marketing ploy, uh, trying to create this fun thing that a lot of people will donate to. Um, the real positive is what's going on behind the scenes with the education, um, the building, the Bitcoin infrastructure, and helping out the un hopefully helping out the unbanked if they can um, turn this into an actual uh, functioning economy. Yeah, yeah, you know um, that goes back to like a topic that we talked about last week. Um, that like Bitcoin is basically a learning experience for a lot of people. No matter how involved you are in Bitcoin, there's probably like a lot more you can learn. But then the hardest part is like getting people involved in the first place who know nothing about it and getting them to like learn the basics and stuff. And like if if uh, if this Dominica experiment can help do that for like 
thousands of people, that is a pretty good development. That is pretty good um, progress towards um, spreading awareness at the very least. Like that's, I think that's one of the best ways to spread Bitcoin awareness is like you can, you can, you can spread all the articles and like guides and videos all you want, but like probably the best way to get someone to learn about how to use Bitcoin is to give them some of it and, you know, educate them about how to use it once they have it, you know? Um, so like, hopefully I'm hoping that like, uh, it won't just be an SMS on their phones. Like it'll also come with like a little miniature guide telling them if you want to withdraw it to like, if you have a smartphone, you can download the blockchain app and download it to, to your, to your own wallet. And it doesn't have to sit, you know, on the cell phone server or whatever. Like, I don't know. Maybe Coinapult has all of that stuff on their, on their servers. But yeah, give it to them for free and teach them how to use it and they'll learn. And, you know, I guess the idea is like if even if they spend that ten dollars worth of Bitcoin on drinks, hopefully they know enough about it and are interested in, in it enough to um, to possibly buy more, maybe buy more from Coinapult directly, you know, support their business and uh, and get those people involved in the Bitcoin economy through this experiment. Yeah, definitely the the main way to spread Bitcoin acceptance and awareness is through education. Uh, like you're not realistically Bitcoin's never going to become legal tender. So we're not going to have governments forcing people to use Bitcoin. You're not going to centrally plan a Bitcoin economy. Um, you, you can't even centrally plan, you know, a regular economy that's, you know, failing miserably right now. Um, the best way to get people to use it is to just um, teach them about it and convince them that it's worthwhile. And then, um, you know, it'll kind of take care of itself. Like, like, you know, the market will do its thing. Mm -hmm. you, you're not going to, you can try all you want to, like, plan things out and, you know, try to jumpstart things. But it's just, it's not going to happen. None of it is going to happen unless people understand what it is and they want it. So, um, yeah, that's what I think about it. I don't think the... I don't it's think not going to be a silver bullet, right? It's not going to be a yeah. magic thing that instantly creates a Bitcoin haven in one fell swoop. Yeah, the party's not going to do anything. Um, you know, at at the most, they're just going to buy drinks with it, and they'll at least get to see how it works through the SMS system because they'll have to, like, you know, actually send the Bitcoin. Um, so I guess that could be kind of an educational experience because you know you're at least using it, but. Um, as far as like giving people ten dollars in Bitcoin and telling them to come spend it at a party, it's not going to be very productive. Nowhere near as productive as um, the actual educational things are going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting experiment, though. We'll have to see what happens, and it, it will certainly make some uh, waves in the media. You know, um, in the U.S. media for sure, and European media, who are going to be watching this probably and seeing what seeing what happens when a whole nation is given free Bitcoin. Um, and you know, and the fact that that's even possible really, um, is an interesting angle as well, because imagine, imagine like a small Island country trying to give, you know, $10 worth of free money in their, in their fiat money to the whole country. Like that's probably not even possible in, in most countries, um, based on like the current banking system and the fact that, yeah, a lot of people are unbanked as well. Um, we have never really had a decent system before for distributing like a ton of you know money like hundreds of thousands of dollars to a large mass of people at once and that alone is like it's going to be a demonstration like a proof of concept for the potential of bitcoin for um distributing large amounts of money to large amounts of people at once the the hardest part is just you know i guess raising all the money and that's what they're going to start doing in the following months starting now so uh yeah good good demonstration of bitcoin's technology and definitely has potential for educating people uh who can become productive members of the bitcoin community in the future another major story that came out this week was uh an early bitcoin pioneer named hal finney uh has passed away um he died of complications with ALS which is Lou Gehrig's disease and I, I well I say died but um 
he was only declared legally dead uh, once you know his pulse stopped. But once that happened, um, you know they threw his body into cryopreservation and and you know took out all his regular blood and, and filled it with a with like a with a, a cryo um, preservation replacement of blood. And they're trying to save his body for a future time when possibly ALS is cured and they can unfreeze him and possibly bring him back to life, which would be revolutionary. But, you know, how this relates to Bitcoin is he was one of the first people who started using Bitcoin back in 2009. Actually started, you know, he started working with Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2008, right when the first uh, Bitcoin white paper came out. And he was he received the first bitcoin transaction from satoshi uh and you know he he helped satoshi on the on the code um he he also um worked on pgp encryption back in the 90s um he was a member of the cypherpunks um and he did he did he did a lot a lot of stuff to promote um you know like new new crazy forms of technology that 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 have a lot of potential um and bitcoin was just like one of those you know and he was a pioneer in this space and uh it, he, apparently he he did a lot to help the to help the early days of this decentralized um infrastructure and yeah he's he was he was a he was a large figure in the community i didn't know that much about him until this week and i did some research on him and uh but yeah he did he, he did a lot and it's it's crazy that now like he he raised like fifteen thousand dollars earlier this year for his medical um bills and he raised that money in bitcoin and um now basically his family is using that that um money to help preserve his body uh for a possible revival in the future so very very futuristic exciting stuff that that this guy has and is currently, you know, um, currently pushing for and working towards. You know, he him he he uses himself, his own mind and his own body, as as an experimental uh, vessel for like brand new, like cutting edge, like mind blowing technology. And it's it's fascinating. I, this this guy was a revolutionary basically in terms of technology. He definitely did a lot for Bitcoin. Uh... Like you said, he was the first recipient of a Bitcoin payment ever. He was part of the, you know, he was on the receiving end of the first transaction between him and uh, Satoshi. And he was he was one of the earliest core developers to to jump on board with uh, Satoshi after, you know, he released it, after he open sourced it and released it, uh, Bitcoin to the public. So... Um, he was definitely a prominent member, even though he may have been kind of uh, in the background for some people. Like, I didn't know much about him either until after I found out that he died. But um, nonetheless, he still did a lot for um, Bitcoin. So in in his honor, the Bitcoin Foundation has teamed up with Jason King of Sean's Outpost, Eric Voorhees, and Roger Ver to start... Um, an ALS research fund where people can actually donate bitcoins uh, to an address that's controlled by the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, they're going to be running this fundraiser from uh, today. They started this morning with the video the Bitcoin Foundation posted uh, this morning, and it's going to go until Thanksgiving. And then they'll, and then the foundation will start accepting nominations for um, research organizations that they can donate the bitcoins to. Uh, and then at that point, they'll take a vote on which organization to give the money to. And then um, on December second, which is like National Giving Day or something like that, they'll actually give the bitcoins to the winning organization. And um, to kick off the fundraiser and uh, advertise a little bit. Um, there was a video posted on the Bitcoin Foundation's YouTube channel where Gavin Andreessen did a ice bucket challenge. Uh, it was a very short video, it was 30 seconds long. He basically says, uh, uh, thanks Hal Finney for being awesome and contributing to Bitcoin. And then he dumped the, the water on his head. And then he challenged... Who did he challenge? Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. Yeah. Uh, Roger Ver. And... Um... 
Jin Young Jin England Yang. from the Jin Bitcoin Yang Foundation. England. Yeah. Um, and so, and you know what? We should actually link to this video in the description because at the end of the video, there's a QR code that you can scan to donate Bitcoin. And um, they actually provide, you know, the actual address as well, which, um, which Sean can put in the description too. And this, uh, it's, it hasn't even been going on for uh, 24 hours yet, and the fund has already received like over five bitcoins, I think, which is like over two thousand dollars, and that's just in one day. And you know, keep in mind, it's going to be going till Thanksgiving, so we could potentially have get a lot of bitcoin money uh, that'll be donated to ALS research, which has you know been in the mainstream lately with this ice bucket thing. Yeah, the ALS ice bucket challenge went viral and raised many millions of dollars really um, yep. for, for ALS and I, I, I heard a story like last week that basically said that like only 27% of the funds donated to the ALS Association actually go towards you know finding a cure and and, and actual research and I guess if that's true um, that's only really because of like bureaucratic overhead and stuff like that that's inherent in you know practically any organization but hopefully, uh, if the Bitcoin Foundation can manage this campaign right, um, hopefully a very, very high percentage of the Bitcoins donated can actually go towards finding a cure. And mm -hmm. maybe it can directly impact, um, you know, if, if we can actually find a cure for ALS through uh, this, these donations, you know, the Bitcoin community can help and have a high percentage of their donations actually go towards a cure. Hal Finney could you know, could be revived and be cured of ALS sometime in the future, which would be insane. Uh, huge development, huge, huge miracle, basically, for the human race to have someone uh, possibly revived from, from cryo sleep and, uh, and then have their, have their terminal disease cured from them by, by, by a cure that was, that was crowdfunded by, by the community. So very exciting to see if that can actually happen and good on the good on the bitcoin foundation for um starting up this campaign um i don't know if uh if if i would dump an, a bucket of ice water on my head um i would probably prefer just donating money directly but uh um good that the bitcoin community is is getting involved with this and um you know fascinating that uh hal finney um might be revived in the in the future yeah as much as i dislike the bitcoin foundation that you know this is a really great thing they're doing um if if you're if you're going to donate your bitcoins to anything this is going to be the thing to donate it to i mean like don't give it to the island party so people can <laughs> go buy drinks with bitcoin um this could this could definitely you know make some progress in ALS research. So, uh, Bitcoin Foundation, you still suck, but you did a good thing. You suck and, for different um, reasons. But <laughs> you're not good, all bad. Good job. Good job for uh, starting a Bitcoin fund for ALS. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll put that link in the description, including the link to um, Gavin Andreessen's video where he dumps himself with ice water and then challenges the others. So, yeah, you guys can check that out and uh, possibly donate as well. So, um, yeah, moving on to uh, another topic. Um, so let's talk about um, some uh, third party Bitcoin companies, you know, that, that hold other people's Bitcoins for various reasons and like the general health of those of those companies. Um, we've had some minor developments this week in, in that in that area. So, for instance, um, Bitcoin exchanges are sometimes criticized for possibly not holding the like amount of money needed to cover people's uh, you know debts on the website, what the website owes them. But um, companies, uh, Bitcoin exchanges are now uh, doing proof of reserves uh, audits to prove that they do have everyone's money, that they aren't going to pull a Mt. Gox anytime in the near future, and that. Um, even if everyone on the uh, who uses the website were to withdraw all their money immediately, the website would be able to give it all back to them immediately. So, 
last week last week we talked about OK coin they have 104 uh, percent reserves and now this week uh, Huobi which is another Chinese exchange um, did a proof of reserves and they have 103.5 percent reserves so uh, good progress in uh, in Bitcoin exchanges um, uh, doing this uh, without any regulation forcing them to they're doing it on their own and uh, servicing their customers at the same time by showing them that they are that they are solvent that they aren't gonna go gox anytime soon and um, yeah progress in in uh, in Bitcoin exchange land uh, and also just as a side note um, Stefan Thomas of Ripple Labs uh, did both audits for OKCoin and um, Huobi and he did it for free and uh, he, he wouldn't take any compensation. He asked the exchanges if they, if they felt like they had to pay for his services to donate money to the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Hmm. So, um, so, yeah, he did that for free on his own time just to kind of, you know, boost confidence in the exchanges and keep them going. Because at this point in Bitcoin's uh, evolution, they're pretty important because it's pretty much the only way uh, people have, uh, you know, mass access to Bitcoin. So... It's important to keep them uh, that they stay solvent, yeah. and uh, hopefully this uh, uh, auditing will become a th thing. I, I know um, OKCoin in particular. I, th I think it was OKCoin. I, I might be mistaken, but they said that um, they would be uh, taking on a regular schedule of auditing. So, oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully this like encourages other exchanges to follow suit, especially the ones that are. That are uh, you know engaged in margin calling, because um, they don't they don't necessarily have uh, proof of reserves or they don't necessarily have um, you know solvency because they possibly use uh, users funds to to um, facilitate margin calling. Is, is is that is that about right? Like how how can how can proof of reserves um, improve the um, improve the confidence in exchanges that participate in margin calling it's um when they, the the two exchanges that i know of it might be more but the two major ones that um that have uh margin trading services bitfinex and btce uh both of which recently suffered flash crashes uh which most people think was due to the to margin calling um so it basically it would work out one of two ways. One, they either have less than 100% because they're taking money from other people's accounts to loan out to investors so they can um, buy more Bitcoin essentially than, than they can pay for and they're betting on gains and the price to pay off their debt. Um, in which case, they would essentially be operating as a fractional reserve bank, um, which is very dangerous. Uh, or they either they, they have... Um, in excess of 100 percent, they they have enough to um, cover everybody's deposits, um, and then they're plus some, and they're using that leftover. Uh, like say, for instance, if Bitfinex has 102 percent reserves, they would use the two percent then to to lend out and keep the rest of it safe. But uh, and that would be no, fine, right? That'd be fine yeah, for that, them to do. That would be fine because. Um, the you know that whatever extra they have in excess of the 100% reserve ratio that's just their money that they can do whatever they want to with um like it's not owned it's owned by the exchange it's not owned by any customer um but we have we have no way of knowing without a full um proof of solvency audit uh whether or not uh Bitfinex and BTCE uh which method they're using if they're doing going the fractional reserve route or if they're just using leftover uh, if they're using their you know their profit to uh, contribute to lend out money uh, we just don't know until they until, until they go they through audits yeah. So, yeah so hopefully they will they should if they uh, if they want to prove themselves as you know legitimate businesses yeah so um, like other other third parties who are trying to increase their confidence with uh, customers and consumers, uh, Coinbase announced this week that they are fully insured on their Bitcoin funds. Anyone who holds Bitcoin on Coinbase is, is insured. Uh, they use like a you know a very high rated um, insurer with you know high rated underwriters. So um, 
apparently the Coinbase has been insured for like the past year, but now they've basically come out and been, been public about it because a lot of other services um, are talking about their their great like insurance of, of, of Bitcoin funds. Like Zoppo is talking about their insurance. So Coinbase isn't exactly like an exchange in the traditional sense. Uh, like try and trade Bitcoin on Coinbase. Um, you're not going to do very well because it takes like five days for your Bitcoin to show up in your account. Um, and you can't exactly like store fiat on Coinbase. So it's not an exchange. But uh, they are trying to improve people's confidence in them. And basically saying that you can hold your Bitcoin with us. It'll, it'll be fine even if we get hacked or if an employee steals it or if something else terrible happens, a server failure, I don't know. It's insured. Um, you know, the, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, how much it's insured up to. Uh, but, you know, it's, it creates more confidence for people who, are, who might be afraid of, you know, things like losing their Bitcoin. Um, and you know it's not F it's not FDIC insured blah blah blah. Well, it it's, it is insured by someone, and um, you aren't you aren't going to lose it that easily if you hold with Coinbase. The only thing with Coinbase is they are fully like regulation compliant. They're ahead of the regulation, uh, fully A AML KYC compliant. So if you do use Coinbase, yes, your bitcoins will be safe. But you might be restricted in some ways in in using your Bitcoin or selling it through Coinbase um, if you engage in like gray area activities like gambling on seals with clubs. Um, people have been reporting issues about uh, withdrawing their Bitcoins to Coinbase and then trying to sell it through Coinbase funds that they won through seals with clubs on poker. Um, they can't do that through Coinbase basically because Coinbase is you know, basically the regulators bitch at this point. I don't want to, I don't want to sound too, um, like harsh, but it's, it's true. Like they're, they're totally dedicated to all these regulations. And in order to be completely compliant, they can't really deal with people who they know, um, through some kind of blockchain analysis. They know that they're engaged in gray area activities or even straight up illicit activities. So Coinbase is not the way to go. If, um, if you are a poker player on Seals of Clubs. But besides that, um, it's pretty safe to hold your Bitcoins there. Or it, it, it seems that way. Um, so yeah, Coinbase, another another company that is trying to improve confidence uh, in, them, in themselves by talking about how their Bitcoins are insured and that they also will not go the way of Gox anytime soon. I think this is a big win for the free market too. Because uh, whenever, whenever, uh, whenever you're talking about free markets uh, in regards to banking, and it, it, you know it always goes towards the Great Depression. Uh, there was no, there was no federal insurance system for the banks during the Great Depression, and everybody lost their money. Like without the FDIC, uh, who would protect our money uh, from from getting from it being stolen or lost or something? Well, the free market, obviously, you know. Coinbase doesn't have an FDIC. No Bitcoin exchange has an FDIC, but a lot of them, um, well, not a lot of them, but Coinbase is, you know, they're getting private insurance on their funds. Uh, Zappo has their, they have all their deposits insured. So, yeah, there's your answer. Who's, who's going to protect your money when you put in a bank? The free market will. Yeah. If if you if you know how to like shop around for different third parties, you know who you want to depend on to protect your Bitcoin. There's options now that are pretty secure and uh, and no and, and you know not just insurance, but they also have like underground vaults with you know offline like paper wallets that you know aren't connected to the internet, and there's armed guards outside these vaults. So, like, not just in the insurance, but just the overall guarding of the Bitcoins in general. They do a very good job of that. And they don't do it because the government is telling them to. They don't do it because, like, uh, you know, it's it's some kind of government mandate. If they do love following the government rules. But, like, the, the whole security thing, like, that's that's them just trying to build consumer trust. Yep, um, that's customer service. It's customer service, yeah. They... they 
they want to build a good customer base that is confident in them and they're working towards that you know everyone looks at i keep going back to gox everyone looks at gox and how it failed so badly and all these bitcoin companies don't want to be that they don't want to be that next gox you know it's going to happen eventually but you know companies like coinbase and zappo and huobi and okcoin they are being they're working pretty hard to not be the next gox and they're showing their customers at the same time that they um, are pretty reliable for for holding bitcoins. Interesting development. Uh, Coinbase is get, is a lot safer now, obviously, and uh, they they do have to be compliant with all these regulations. But I use Coinbase personally. I, I've never um, bought, but I sell, and you know I didn't have to give up that much information. Um, I've I've heard some people say that they uh, that Coinbase makes them take selfies when they're trying to like withdraw their funds or something. Huh. Um, <laughs> but all all I've ever had to do was uh, give my name, address, and bank account information. Um, hmm. You know, that's all I've ever had to do with Coinbase. May you know, it, it's always possible they could change it up depending on you know, case as the regulations basis. As the regulations they have to comply with get stricter, you know, obviously they're gonna be it's gonna be a little more of a pain to deal with them. But but yeah, I've um, I've never had any problems with Coinbase. But like I said, I only I only sell small amounts every once in a while. Yeah, I'm not a regular user, so. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote a piece earlier this week for Coin Brief, uh, talking about the ethics of Bitcoin journalists owning Bitcoin. Uh, meaning you know their news writers or producers who talk about and cover bitcoin and cryptocurrencies but at the same time they own bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies and there's this author uh who is an editor at upstart business journal and uh he also wrote an article for linkedin and um i i took him to task for that article in which he said that uh you know pe people who own Bitcoin and cover it are, you know, have a conflict of interest and that they're inherently biased towards Bitcoin and, you know, you, you, you can't necessarily trust them because uh, they're in favor of, like, like, you can't trust their news writing because they won't portray things as they actually are because they, they own Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, that's... It's not necessarily true, uh, <laughs> especially since Bitcoin, he's, he views Bitcoin too much as, as property or as like a stock that, that people are invested in, you know, that people want to get, get rich off of. But Bitcoin journalists, especially those who get paid in Bitcoin, like us, for Coin Brief, um, it's just a form of money. It's just another form of money that you get paid for your work in so like it's not like if if i were to like change my reporting like uh ethos around bitcoin and purposely like you know started trying to pump bitcoin with every single article trying to make it look good trying to get people to buy it you know um like first of all my credibility is going to go way down because people are going to be able to tell that i'm just pumping bitcoin all the time and that's not to say that none of my articles pump Bitcoin. Um, some some do kind of do that, uh, time, uh, you know, incidentally, like my Lighthouse article. I talked about Mike Hearn's Lighthouse can massively improve Bitcoin. Um, but that's just a fact. I talk. I like to talk about stuff that in, can improve the system. That's not necessarily wanting, you know, encouraging people to buy it. And even if other people did buy Bitcoin because they read my story, um, Oh, whoop do that might make that might make the pr the price go up by like 25 cents based on a couple readers who decided to buy Bitcoin. And uh I don't own that much Bitcoin. I will disclose that obviously I own some of it cuz I get paid in it, but uh I'm not going to get rich anytime soon off Bitcoin. And if I were to change um you know how I report on stories and just pump Bitcoin all the time, um I would lose readership a lot. Um you know, people uh, our editor probably wouldn't be that happy if all I'm doing is pumping Bitcoin because um, it, it, it debases your credibility a bit. So like the, the notion that people who own Bitcoin and cover it are, you know, going to be untrustworthy. Uh, it's 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 based on an old school fear about, you know, about 
old school journalism, you know, journalists who like might own a ton of, you know, a ton of NASDAQ stock in a, pers- in a particular company and would only favor that company over all other competitors. But it's, it's not the same dynamics as that anymore. This is, this is an entirely new economy and you can't like just base people's biases off of the particular form of payment they get, you know? I like John Matonis's comment on the this whole situation because it's um I had the same I had the same thought like as soon as I started reading your article and he, and he says um it's like saying people who write about um United States dollars and monetary policy shouldn't own dollars. You know, that's that's what yeah. I immediately that's what immediately came into my head as soon as I started reading this article because that is that's all Bitcoin is. It's just a currency. Um obviously um, obviously, it's still you know pretty tightly linked to uh, USD, so we're going to benefit if the price of Bitcoin does go up. Obviously, but like you said, um, there is no single Bitcoin journalist that is influential enough to produce a significant increase in the Bitcoin price. Yeah. So th- there's just there's just no incentive there um, to do it. Because you know, at, at most you would get like a fraction of a dollar, um, mm-hmm. which I know for me it it would take way more than that for me to sell my bitcoins. So, um, yeah, and most of the things um, on Coinbrief specifically, um, most of the things we write about don't even have to do with with um, pumping the bitcoin price. Like I do price analysis sometimes where I uh, try to you know, figure out why why the price is moving the way it is, if there's any news events events related to it, and where it might go in the future. Um, and I also have started doing a weekly uh, uh, market report series where I just talk about uh, what the price did throughout the course of a week. Um, and, you know, there's not really anything I could do there to pump the price because um, I'm just reporting on things that have already happened. So I I don't I just don't understand where this guy gets this idea that um, Bitcoin journalists shouldn't own Bitcoin. Like, should we do should we do it for free and be broke all the time? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, for a lot for a lot of Bitcoin journalists, like Bitcoin is their main source of income. Because um, depending on how hard you work at it, you can make pretty decent money at it. Oh yeah, so, tons of freelance work to be done out there. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's just—it's really just a ridiculous notion that um, that you can't own Bitcoin if you write about it. Like, you know, so economists whose job it is to is to write about um, dollars and and how they affect the economy should they just um, not use dollars? If they're, if they're <laughs> yeah yeah if they're if they're American and they write about USD, should they get paid in the euros or, or vice versa? Yeah, it's just I know yeah it's, it's just a ridiculous idea. Yeah, I, it's just a monetary I, I system. Kind of, yeah, I thought it was kind of funny that he said that. Yeah, um, yeah, I I think that my article um, pretty much you know destroys that argument pretty pretty well, and with with some help from John Matonis as well. Um, it's just a money system. It's just a form of money. It's not a stock. It's not you know. It's not people who view it as an investment to begin with uh, are kind of mistaken because you're not guaranteed to make money off it. The price is not guaranteed to go up. Um, it's it's just a new form of money that's based on a new form of technology that was created by Satoshi Nakamoto five years ago. So um, that's what I'm biased in favor of. I'm biased in favor of the te- of the technology, the underlying technology, um, and it's not even it's not unique to Bitcoin either. Hundreds of other cryptocurrencies have been built, which are you know minor variations of on Bitcoin and, and potentially use different you know different uh, algorithms for maintaining the network and stuff like that but the the underlying innovation itself that's yeah i am biased and i want to see that succeed i want to um i I want to see it change the world so i guess you could say that like i'm (laughs) i am biased in favor of innovation and uh and and change but that's that's what that author should be biased in favor of as well since you know he's the tech and innovation editor of that website so you know that's that's what we're all working towards we're all here because of the fundamental innovation that happened five years ago and w- without that um none of us 
would even be doing this right now con- concerning Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Maybe we'd be doing a podcast about a different topic, like economics or politics. Um, so yeah, the, the inherent bias towards the technology is there, but the idea that we're going to change what our content is and what kind of stories we cover to try and pump the price, that's just naive, and anyone who actually tries to do that is not spending their time wisely. They're not, you know, they don't have the right goals in mind, and uh, it's, it's not going to work for them. So, yeah, um, it's just a money system, basically. Yeah, there's, there is not enough, there's not nearly enough incentive for me to um, deliberately cut down on the quality of my articles to try and manipulate the price. It's just, it's impossible to do, like, you know, I know. I just write it, I, I write about Bitcoin and, you know, maybe a couple thousand people read it, you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna probably a couple market. thousand people who already own Bitcoin. You know, I, yeah. like these people yeah. don't understand that our readership also already owns these cryptocurrencies in the majority of cases. In the majority of cases, so like <laughs> none of our articles are going to convince you know new adopters to suddenly go out and buy like uh, you know five hundred dollars, you know, like a whole Bitcoin, you know, just based on one article. I highly, highly doubt that's going to happen. Yeah, pretty ridiculous. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, covered a lot of pretty pretty good topics this week. Um, so yeah, everyone, uh, I'll I'll put the ALS uh, donation stuff in in the description, and um, also the link to my um, to my Bitcoin journalism ethics article as well in the description. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone and listening as well. Um, this has been the Coin Brief podcast episode 13 um we'll be back next week with with more news um please subscribe to our channel if you like us and also like the videos if you like us and um yeah we'll be back next week with with some uh with some new stories yep follow us on twitter hell yeah sean myself and official coin brief uh twitter yeah at crypto sean at evan faggart at uh at coin brief and um, yeah, see you guys next week with some nor- for some more stories, and uh, have a have a great week, everyone.